Corey Johnson in for Emily Chang, and this is the best of Bloomberg Technology. We'll bring you all the top stories from the week in tech. Well, coming up, is the iPhone X just too expensive? Analysts cut their numbers. Plus, Amazon announces strong sales of the Alexa. We'll look at how the smart home tech fits into Amazon's product plans for 2018. And among all the cryptocurrencies emerging this year, Ripple is breaking out of Bitcoin's shadow. We're going to hear from Ripple's CEO, Brad Gerlinghouse. But first, to our lead, a handful of Apple analysts have lowered iPhone 10 shipment projections for next quarter, citing weak demand late in the holiday season. Sinolink Securities expects iPhone sales to decline sequentially by 10 million units next quarter, while Jail Warren Capital sees shipments falling by 5 million. It's blaming the iPhone's high price, price and a lack of groundbreaking innovations. We talked it out with Bloomberg Technologies' Alex Webb. The uh, iPhone 10 was re released six weeks after the iPhone 8, and so there was an, uh, a fear that maybe if they got too close to the release date for the Samsung the, the ne next high-end smartphone, which is probably going to come in March, if they get too close to that, then there's not going to be enough demand to sustain the numbers that they would otherwise hope to get. So competition is another part of this. Exactly, yes. And I, I think, you know, particularly in China, we've seen that a lot of the local manufacturers are coming out with products now which are you know, far lower price point than what Apple is able to offer but also very similar features. Now, of course, no one quite yet has the um, Face ID, the 3D sensor, which the iPhone has, but as some of these anal analysts, analysts were writing earlier today, that's perhaps not been enough to, to um, gin up demand for the product. It seems to be the, a big part of Apple's strategy at, with this phone release, both these phones, is really um, uh, ginning up, if you will, a marketplace uh, of potentially new applications and stuff we haven't really seen yet. So the phone does some really cool facial recognition stuff, or could, but there aren't a lot of applications for that. The phone a, has a lot of uh, interesting features, haptic features and other things that the earlier phones didn't have, but there's no real uses for it yet. I mean, it, it's the kind of curse of being Apple that, of course, they're very secretive about what they've got in the pipeline in terms of hardware. Now, when they released the phone or unveiled the phone in September ahead of its release in November, that's not a huge time frame for analysts, sorry, for developers to start coming right. up with, with new tools which you can download in the App Store. It might be that over the course of the next year or 18 months, we see far more compelling innovations which use these 3D sensors. I think one of the things some of these analysts aren't really taking into account, though, is that, the, that we'll never know the mix between iPhone 8s and iPhone 10s. But that if they sell a lot more iPhone 10s, both the top line and the bottom line, because the phone's so expensive, are going to do so well. And there's always this chatter saying, oh, China's not going to buy the expensive phone. India's not going to buy the expensive phone. What we've seen is quite the opposite, that China loves the big expensive phone and are willing to pay up for that luxury uh, item. I, I think the other element you've got to think about is that the iPhone 8 is largely the same form factor, shape, design as the iPhone 6. You know, there's not a huge amount of change between those three generations of phones, 6, 6S, 7, and 8. That means, of course, the bill of material has come right the way down for the iPhone 8, but the price point is still pretty high. So it's not the end of the world if Apple's selling iPhone 8s rather than iPhone 10s because the, the sort of four, three or four years they've had on the phone have meant that the components are very cheap for them. And so gross, gross margins might be better on the 8 then? Well, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to tell right. that. There are some estimates out there. It's not necessarily they'll be better, but they're not perhaps significantly worse, I think, than on the 10. And to be clear, the estimates, even though some of the numbers have come down, they're still predicting the biggest first quarter Apple's ever had. They're still predicting 10% year-over-year revenue growth on one of the biggest, most profitable companies in the world. Absolutely. And don't forget, of course, Apple itself, as you said, doesn't break out any iPhone um, revenue numbers. And so what we're going to be seeing or is... Or specific iPhones. We'll know iPhones, but we won't know specifically exactly, which yes, phones. Exactly, yes, which phones they are. And so um, that means that, of course, then the, uh, the uh, forecast for the revenue forecast for the right. quarter that Apple has made itself, that might already take into account some of this slackening demand. And that was Bloomberg's Technologies' Alex Webb. For more reaction to these forecasts, Bloomberg David Weston and Alex Steele spoke with Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster. The veteran Apple analyst says, don't worry, be happy. If you take the numbers for face value uh, for the production in the March quarter, that would imply about 50% of the phones in the next year will be the iPhone 10. That's the $1,000 plus phone. And investors are expecting that number to be 25 to 30%. So this is, uh, I think, expected, number one, and number two, if I think it's actually a positive. 
So that's the first quarter of 2018. Take us back to the fourth quarter of 2017 for a minute. They brought the eight and the 10 out at the same time, talked about them. The eight sales initially were somewhat disappointing. We were told that's because everyone's waiting for a 10. They're gonna make it up with the 10. Do we have any indication whether they in fact made it up in the fourth quarter with the 10? We, we have a little bit of an indication by looking at the supply. And we talked to some of the uh, builders, the, the, the suppliers, and they've been struggling to keep up. And if you look at the inventory in the U.S., we check this every day. We look at about uh, 140 stores in the U.S. every day. And they're just reaching now uh, full supply. They're at 97% as of yesterday. My point is this, is that if there wasn't a lot of demand for this phone, for the iPhone 10, you'd have more supply. And so I think that this is, uh, you know, the numbers are going to be reported in the next three weeks, and I think that they will do better than expected in terms of the iPhone 10. And if I was going to just boil the whole Apple story down over the next two quarters into one thought, it's this idea that ASPs, the average selling price of the iPhone, is going to be going up, and I think that's going to be the key factor investors are going to focus on. So talk about the ASP specifically, because there are reports, could be right, could be wrong, that in fact there's some resistance on the price, because as you say, it is over $1,000. Do we know whether in fact customers are getting a little price sensitive when it comes to Apple? Well, we can look back at what the supply is, and the supply remains really tight, which is an indication that demand is good. I, I think the, uh, the, the simple takeaway is this, is that uh, the ASPs are going to go up meaningfully. We think they'll be up greater than 15% this year. Uh, and we're just, the, it's important to note is that the vast majority of people who buy iPhones, greater than 80% globally, buy it on a monthly basis. And so you're talking about going from $40 to $48 a month, and that $8 difference is, is uh, reasonable for most people. Does that mean that Apple has to sell less of those iPhone 10s, that their ASPs are going to go up that much? Well, uh, or do you think it can fire yeah, on both of those I cylinders? I think it can fire on both cylinders. And if, if you look at your bang for your buck, your phone is your highest utility you're going to get of any technology. And so I think people recognize that. Even though that's a big number, $1,000, I think people recognize the value they're getting. And, and what about overseas? Because China has been a big target for Apple. There's been thought that when you get up to those kind of prices, you're really going to get crowded out because they've got a lot cheaper competitors over there. Do we have a sense of how they're doing, for example, in China? Don't have as good of a sense there. It's been a uh, boom and bust. The iPhone 6 cycle uh, three years ago, they did exceptionally well in China. And uh, in the last two years, it's been more difficult. I suspect that the first phase of the iPhone 10 is going to do well in China, but then competition will probably chip away. And that was Loop Ventures co-founder Gene Munster speaking with David Weston and Alex Steele on Bloomberg Daybreak Americas. Well, coming up, big tech, big gains. Facebook, Google, Amazon all saw double-digit gains in revenue this year. There could be headwinds on the horizon. Plus, a tumultuous 12 months for Uber. We delve into the ride hailing app's biggest roadblocks for 2017. This is Bloomberg. Well, as we close out 2017, big cap tech companies are holding on to some historic gains. The Nasdaq 100 up over 30% in the year. It was driven by fast-growing sales, record profits, and hopes of continued growth. But a big tech reckoning could come in 2018 in the form of government oversight and a fractured relationship with users. We discussed with the James Chalkmock, the annals of Moness, Crespi, and Hart. I love the way that you have covered these companies because you know, you're looking at a lot of these very big companies, mm -hmm. but with a skeptical eye and at some of the tough issues we've seen uh, them show. When you look at them, who's sort of got the toughest haul in the coming year? Yeah, I mean, look, it's been an interesting year because all these companies have posted tremendous financial successes and definitely grown uh, much bigger than uh, than I thought. I think what many thought at the beginning of the year uh, in their own right. But it, at the same time, we saw all this regulatory scrutiny across all the companies. Uh, the election certainly didn't help, uh, you know, uh, with that scrutiny. But as we look into 2018, I think that you can handicap it as Amazon is likely uh, in the driver's seat when it comes to favorable tail tailwinds, uh, favorable winds you know, uh, when it comes uh, with regulatory environment. But as you move down that list within the fan group, I think Google is next. They used to be the politically savviest. But then you have uh, Facebook that I think that they're drawing ire from both sides of the political spectrum. I think it's going to get worse as uh, we approach the midterm elections uh, later in 2018. So I think that that scrutiny will only escalate from here, at least from a headline perspective. Well, so, all right, so bad fake news headlines is what you're predicting here for Probably Twitter, I'll throw that one in there too. It's a company sure. you've covered, I know. But Twitter, Facebook, 
YouTube, part of Google. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that actually hurts financial results? Do, do you know, I, over the weekend, actually, Facebook introduced this feature that let you uh, uh, find out if you actually retweeted or, or favorited or fa whatever, uh, or reposted yeah. something from a fake, from a Russian fake news site. I thought that was an interesting response, but done very quietly over the holiday weekend. Yeah, I, I think financially speaking, uh, it's full steam ahead for all these companies. You have Amazon continuing to gain share versus uh, traditional retail. Facebook continuing to gain share versus traditional media outlets. Google, the same story there. Twitter, you know, they're trying to carve out a path of their own um, going more niche. But at the end of the day, I mean, these companies will continue to grow. I think that the, the um, from a financial Wait, standpoint... Wait, so what you're saying, so what you're saying is a lot of headlines, who cares, it's not going to affect their financial results. Yeah, it's not going to uh, affect their financial results, but you do have to think about, uh, from a stock perspective, you know, the degree of multiple expansion uh, that's in there. Obviously, we have the earnings power, but at the same time, valuations have uh, been steadily rising for all these companies. They're still relatively attractive uh, for valuation relative to their growth rate, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that that is something that investors will definitely uh, need to consider. So do we separate investment results from some of those other companies? I mean, one of the things I think, you know, you mentioned uh, uh, legal problems potential, uh, mm -hmm. not looming for Amazon, but boy, uh, there's no company that scares, you know, they used to say when Mike Wallace would knock on the door, don't answer it because 60 minutes is outside trying to bust you at something. Well, Amazon comes into your business model. Yeah. Every CEO in America is scared of that, whether it's a small business or a large business. And I wonder if there's a time when uh, regulatory concerns will concern Amazon, not least of which because this president doesn't like the Washington Post, and which is owned by Jeff Bezos. Sure. Uh, I think it will come, but it will come later. Because right now you're in a situation where you have the Amazon moving closer to all the federal agencies with AWS. Uh, you have uh, them shopping around their uh, second headquarters where all these cities are clamoring for the attention to get that. Which and means the, you're going to tick off every single city you didn't choose. That's not going to solve political problems. It's going to make it's going to make political yeah, problems. And, and at the same time, you also have all these new fulfillment centers that will open up from a headline perspective, new jobs and, and whatnot. So I think Amazon is safe for now, but I think that once you trigger some major headlines, such as reaching a trillion dollars in value, I think that that will reopen the floodgates for regulators to come in. Because right now, I think regulators are going to be more focused on things that could potentially affect the election and less... Um, you know, the, uh, because if this was actually an issue, the FTC would have uh, scrutinized the Whole Foods acquisition a hell of a lot more than just a one sentence response, which we think was, um, was in, uh, really? wasn't, wasn't, um, you're you know, putting, right your, you're do. putting your faith, you're putting your faith in government regulators, really, James? <laughs> Look, you are, I, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying that there there are priorities, and then there are incentives. And what are the regulators incentivized to do? It's incentivized, you know, to attack the things that, um, you know, can affect, uh, you know, you know th their political uh, prospects. Uh, and Amazon. I just, uh, yeah. No, I get. It. I, I, I'll yeah. give you that. I'm just giving you a hard. I mean, time. look. I, I think 2018. The bigger story for 2018 is all these companies have been growing in their own right. Um, but right. I think that what you'll see in 2018 is them to start to encroach onto each other's territory. You know, you have the Google versus Amazon battle brewing. You have the, uh, the Google versus Facebook battle brewing. And I think that those battles will continue to escalate. So it'll be a question of, will not if these companies will get bigger, but will there be, you know, a zero sum type of aspect where share shifts yeah. will start to occur between the two. And I think it that will be interesting. It is curious that with the duopoly in advertising of Facebook and, Am and, and uh, Google, you really do have Amazon growing a big advertising business. And with the, the lock on search that Google has, mm -hmm. with the devices like Echo, you actually see Amazon getting into search in its own way. Yeah, exactly. Because you're you're eliminating the incentive to search on Google explicitly when you can introduce a discovery mechanism on Amazon. Because you're in a, uh, when you look at Google, the product listing ads have been the bread and butter uh, for the company in recent years, and uh, as you shift that away, and then you look at the content side of the equation, where they're starting, they're, Amazon is likely going to be the biggest content spender in the industry, potentially even eclipsing Netflix. You know, so what are the implications there for YouTube? Uh, and Facebook as well. And that was James Chalkmock, analyst Moness Crespi Hart. Well, technology's most noxious product of 2017 may have been fake news. Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer looks at the fake news hits of the year and what social media companies can do to contain it. 
2017 is the year we realized how quick and easy spreading misinformation on social media is and how profitable the spread of fake news can be. Before the US presidential election, fake news was a get-rich-quick scheme to cash in on online advertising, but this year we learned it is also a tool to disrupt democracy. The Kremlin-backed internet research agency reached over 150 million Americans on Facebook with inflammatory posts intended to stir conflict over issues like race and religion. This was done with 80,000 posts boosted by $100,000 in ad spending. These ads are just the tip of a very large iceberg. And it resulted in Google, Facebook, and Twitter all testifying in hours of congressional hearings about Russia's tactics and how they can try to stop them. But it's not limited to the U.S. The spread of fake news became a global issue in 2017, France and Germany successfully fighting the scourge in their own elections. Meantime, other governments are using Facebook as a tool to spread propaganda. A genocide in Myanmar of the Rohingya Muslim population and an attack in the Philippines on a local news organization and much more. So just what can big tech do to rein this in? Facebook's trying the human route, hiring thousands of people to sift through all that content. But critics also worry about social media companies taking too many liberties and going too far with their censorship. Twitter said they shut down thousands of accounts and are taking steps to get tougher on extremists while investigating further. No matter what the sites do, one thing's for sure, fake news is going to get harder to stop. Facebook often argues that it's a technology company, not a media company. Well, to take on fake news in 2018, it may have to be both. And that was Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer. Well, coming up, Silicon Valley veteran Tom Siebel joins us to talk about punctuated equilibrium. It's a big idea that helps explain innovation. Plus, Amazon could be a big holiday winner again, announcing that 4 million people trialed Amazon Prime in just one week. We'll take an in-depth look at the e-commerce giant. This is Bloomberg. All right, he's been part of the fabric of Silicon Valley for quite a while. One of the titans of enterprise software, his Siebel Systems, acquired by Oracle for $5 billion in 2006. Now, Tom Siebel is now the CEO of C3 IoT. Is focused on software for what he calls the digital transformation. And whenever we sit down, he seems to have some big ideas. We are working with some of the world's largest corporations to apply elastic cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and take advantage of the Internet of Things to basically engage in what is being called digital transformation. And basically taking companies that, that aren't yet digital in all the ways that they can do their work and to get there. Yes, they're now using this new generation of information, this new step function of information technology that's come online in the 21st century to change everything about the way they manage their business processes, design products, deliver products, deliver services. It's really, this is a, like nothing we've seen before. Now I love uh, your idea about how we kind of look at technology to see new things. You came with this, they were found this idea of punctuated equilibrium, a notion of sort of from geology, which, which basically says, tell me if I'm paraphrasing right, that by the time you've seen it, it's too late, that the big changes in evolution happen even faster than we can record them. So in geology, if we see a, a new plant species or a new kind of animal, the big change of the, this thing coming into existence has already happened. Uh, the suggestion is the same thing is happening in technology. I think so. I, I gave this some thought. So I'm, I'm attempting to explain what's going on where we're seeing an exponential growth in the adoption, growth rate in the adoption of these new technologies. Right. Again, elastic cloud computing, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. And then the other aspect of this that I couldn't quite explain, like, it's like you, I've been around this business for a few decades now, yeah. and as we move, a lot. As, we, as we move from mainframe computing to mini computing to personal computing to the Internet, all of these decisions were made by the CIO. Right. And now these digital transformations are all being driven by the CEO, and I was trying to figure out what this was all about, because it's massively disruptive. And so I took a page out of evolutionary biology, and if you look at you know, early additions to the origin of species, Darwin thought that you know, speciation of the planet was kind of a continuous function right. that took place like we think in the information technology business that Moore's law is a continuous function, that everything just you know constantly you know, doubles every 18 price, months, yeah. right? 
But, but that it was, wasn't until like this century that uh, evolutionary biologists by the name of Stephen Gold said it didn't happen this way. Speciation wasn't a continuous process because Darwin couldn't explain the gaps in the fossil record. Right. And so what, what Stephen Gold describes is this concept of punctuated equilibrium. And he said going back even the last 400 million years, which is a relatively short period of time in the history of the planet, we've had you know, six mass extinction events, the most recent being 65 million years ago when that meteor hit right, Yucatan right, right. and something like 85% of the species on Earth disappeared, including the dinosaurs. So then, then, then after you have this mass extinction event, you have a mass speciation, which in that case was good for us because the mammals filled the space that the dinosaurs right, right, right. had. Now, Let's look at what's going on in the corporate world. Since 2000, 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. They've merged, they've well, gone bankrupt. You, you disappeared over that effect, and I went back and started checking this. I couldn't believe that just since 2000, 50% of the, uh, the, the Fortune 500 companies have gone away. But it, it's amazing. Some have gone away through you know, Enrons and WorldComs because of fraud. Some have just had big, massive mergers that have taken them out or taken out failing businesses. Businesses like Compaq that seem to be at the top of their game, taken out probably right before they're about to get hit by an asteroid. Gone, or Hewlett Pack, or, yeah. or maybe I IBM's next, who knows? But then you have what, what, what you talk about every day on the show and what you and I are living in Silicon Valley is this mass speciation that's going on with companies with this new, whatever we talk about here, this new DNA, the Airbnbs, right. the Ubers, the well, Amazon. What I always say about the iPhone, for example, they, when the new iPhone comes out and someone's gonna say, ah, oh, it's not that different than the last one. Well, the big change was when there was no iPhone until there was an iPhone, when there was no mobile, when there's no cloud to when there is a cloud. Everything after that's kind of a, a, a step change, but that big change is the big one that matters. The, tele the telecommunications industry as we knew it when you and I grew up is, is gone. Sure. And it's been replaced by the, by the portable uh, computer and the, and, the, and the portable communication device. But I, it's, are there still companies out there that can reinvent themselves enough to, uh, to, com to survive this new digital age? Oh, I think if you look at what's going on, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's in the funniest of places like Caterpillar, like John Deere, Engie in Paris, and now in Rome, Department of Defense. Uh, these, are, you know, these are companies where you I have, guess the Department of Defense doesn't have a choice. It has to evolve. But, but it can't go away. Massive, massive, uh, you know, and these are CEOs. So you wonder, why is the CEO at the table making these technology decisions? He or she was never there before. And I think the fear is that the, you either you know, you get on the train or you're going to be on the tracks. You're Maybe they're big enough business. thinkers that they can actually get out ahead of this stuff, not try to buy, you know, there used to be this, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Maybe someone will get fired for buying IBM now. Hey, if you're Walmart and you're looking at Amazon and coming down the tracks, you're in a world of hurt, okay? And if you're in the automotive industry and you look at Uber or Tesla and, you know, what's going on there, and you don't adopt, you don't change. You know, it's not going to end well. It sounds also like what you're talking about with, with AI or IoT, pardon all the buzzwords, but uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, you're really talking about process, not just buy the latest software, we'll figure it out for you. You know, it changes everything. I mean, the, the, I used to think that the Internet of Things was about the censoring of value chains. It isn't. Okay, Internet of Things is about the fact that everything is becoming a computer. It's a change in the form factor of computing devices. So eyeglasses, heart monitors, you know, smart meters, cars, thermostats, refrigerators, everything's a computer. And then you apply Metcalfe's law to that where the power of the network is a function of, say, How many 50 nodes? Yeah. billion nodes squared. Hey, that's a pretty powerful network. That was Tom Siebel, the CEO of C3 IoT. Coming up, Bitcoin is not the highest rising cryptocurrency. That honor belongs to Ripple XRP. We got the CEO of Ripple to tell us what's going to happen with uh, all the tens of billions of dollars of Ripple his company's sitting on. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays at 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the best of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Corey Johnson. Well, digital currency Ripple is breaking out of Bitcoin's shadow. Its value exploded over the last year, up more than 21,000%, more than any other cryptocurrency. Brad Gerlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, joined us from New York to argue that Ripple has functionality that Bitcoin can only dream of. 
there's a lot of hype in this space, but I think there's also a, a, lot, think? Of, a, lot, there's a lot of hype, but there's a lot of reality. And Ripple's been very focused on how do we create real utility and solve a real problem. And in this case, it's a, for cross-border payments, which is a multi-trillion dollar problem. And if we could reduce the friction there using blockchain technologies, we think we can create a lot of value for consumers, for banks, for the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing of going to an ATM, anyone who travels overseas and goes to an ATM machine and sees the massive fees slapped on their, just to access their own money, often from the same bank that they use for in their native country, knows what a problem this is, let alone the huge businesses that Western Union and others have moving currency. But it looks like you're looking far beyond that, I guess, into actually what the banks themselves are paying. You know, even within the banking community, there's a few banks that kind of sit on the top of the entire global payments infrastructure. And all the other banks end up paying them to help settle the global liquidity that's required for commerce, for small businesses, for retail. And across the board, it's kind of amazing that we still live in a world where to send money to London today, the fastest thing for you or I to do would be to drive to, well, for you, for SFO, for me here in New York, to JFK or Newark, and fly the money to London. That's crazy. We live in the age of the internet, and we can't move our own money in real time. And of course, as you said, the costs here can be really high. Yeah, um, uh, it, it's a fascinating thing. It seems like the kind of thing I love when you talk about this, saying it should be as easy as sending an email or moving any other piece of digital information, downloading a website or whatever. When you make the sale uh, for this, this business, to whom do you make the sale? Well, we really are in the business of selling solutions, selling technology to banks. Part of that is simply a software sale. And part of that also for customers that want to take advantage of using a digital asset like XRP for liquidity. What that means is instead of pre-funding literally the trillions of dollars that banks have with other banks around the world, they pre-fund that amount that sits there. It's really dormant cash sitting there. With digital assets, you can make that much more real time to enable a payment across a, a border into another currency in real time. Today, Ripple's doing that into uh, Mexico with companies like Qualix, and we certainly see that expanding with uh, other partners and customers over time. Brad, I, I want to take you into the Bloomberg Terminal. Uh, I, I think you've seen this. I sent you guys a screenshot earlier this week, or a few weeks ago. Uh, when we created this uh, monitor of cryptocurrencies on the Bloomberg, we listened to the prices of these cryptocurrencies, and look, lo and behold, number two right there, just because we picked it to be number two, is Ripple. And when I look at what that has done over the last year, holy cow, look at that gain. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a stunning gain for anything, particularly in the last few weeks, as we pointed out earlier. But uh, that price right now of a uh, buck 23, we'll call it, how many coins or how many uh, 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 XRPs do, does Ripple uh, own right now? Ripple owns 61% of it. There's 100 billion units of XRP that are created. We own about 61% of them. I think it, you know, there's no doubt 2017 has been, you know, amongst other things, the year of crypto. And within the year of crypto, XRP has outperformed every other digital asset out there. So uh, year to date, as, your, as that chart showed, we're up about 20,000%. If you ask it, why but is that? But that also, that gives you a, a what, about 70, $75 billion worth of uh, coin right now? That gives us a huge strategic asset to go invest in and accelerate the vision we see for an internet of value that I was describing earlier. Mm -hmm. For me, this is all about you know, an opportunity to participate and accelerate a vision we've had for some time. I think the reason why there's been excitement around XRP, well, there's been excitement around digital assets broadly, XRP specifically because people have increasingly realized that we have real customers, we have the best performing technology. Right. I think I know you have actually talked about this, but to complete a Bitcoin transaction takes about forty dollars and the transaction cost. And it's slow. And it takes several hours on average. In contrast, XRP is very efficient. It settles in about three, three to four seconds and costs fractions of a penny. So while I think there are lots of use cases and utility you can have from Bitcoin, it's right. not going to be a payments solution in its current form. I think it's a store of value. I'm long Bitcoin, I think there's value there. But I think when you talk about lots of other use cases and in all of these digital yeah. assets, I think it comes back to what's the utility? What's the problem that's being solved? And are there real customers that can take advantage of that? But if you're sitting on $75 billion worth of an asset, are you, is, do you envision a scenario over the next year where you'll sell any of that? Well, certainly we use some of it day by day and week by week to invest in the ecosystem. So we use 
in December, we actually publicly uh, produce a, a quarterly market report talking about what's going on in the XRP markets. And it, we sell a little bit every uh, with market makers to incentivize market makers. We want to make sure we have very tight liquidity between XRP and other, dig, uh, excuse me, not other digital currencies, but fiat. So we want to go into, as I was describing right. earlier, into the Mexican peso. We want tight spreads between the Mexican peso and XRP and other currencies. So we work with market makers globally. We work with exchanges globally to make sure that there is very good liquidity to deliver on that. That was Brad Gerlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple. With well, cyber currencies unprecedented surge in the last months of the year, a weird handful of stocks have glommed onto the craze, appropriating the excitement around blockchain. Among the biggest of them, Hong Kong-based startup UBI Blockchain Internet, whose stock has risen more than 1,000% this year. I wrote a story about the company for Bloomberg News. You can find it at Bloomberg.com or in the Bloomberg Terminal. And I talked about the blockchain bump with Bloomberg News reporter Julie Verhage. This is a prime example of what's been going on the past month or two in particular, and that there's a juice maker that decides to put blockchain in its name. There's a sports bra maker that decides to put blockchain in its name. An e-cigarettes company that does the same Wait, thing. Wait, sports and bras and sports blockchain? Sports bras, I know. I mean, who would have thought blockchain could help the manufacturing process for sports bras, I guess. Uh, but the thing is, none of them are actually doing anything in blockchain, it seems like. It's just adding that to the name, sort of like the late 90s, early 2000s, when companies were adding .com to their name, not really doing anything in, in, with the internet. But their stocks would surge, right? It's just deja vu all over again. Well, when I was a money manager, when I was uh, looking for stocks that I didn't believe in, I would look for things that were right in long line with a trend, a social media company that didn't have a social media network or a wireless company that didn't have a wireless product. So when I saw this one, not that it's, I don't know if it's fake or real or what it is, but when I saw that it has both Internet of Things and blockchain in its description and has zero revenues and over a billion dollars in valuation, I thought, mm -hmm. this one is worth kicking around a little bit. Right, not even just no revenues. It has basically $15,000 in cash on hand. You write in your story, they're burning through about $220,000 a month. Uh, it doesn't seem like a company that was one that should be soaring in valuation, right? I think there was a quote in your story from a professor actually saying that the profile of the company is scary. And that basically is the summation of what this whole thing is. And that's just not any professor, it's Charles Lee, an accounting professor at Stanford Business School, who's written very positively about Chinese reverse mergers. Even then he finds this one uh, concerning. The other thing I did is, is go back uh, and look at the progeny, who's behind this deal. And I was really surprised to see they only list four executives. And three of the people at the company, one a former director and, and two other former executives, at something called American Bioengineering, um, uh, American Chinese Bioengineering, AOB, right? American Oriental uh, uh, Bioengineering. And their product was called the Urine Stopper. Their expertise was in stopping bedwetting. And you managed to get bedwetting into a headline at Bloomberg. I, I love you it's, for that, Corey. <laughs> it's, uh, I appreciate the love. It's my finest achievement as a Bloomberg employee for these low so many years. No, but these guys, I mean, that's just it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I talked to one of the lawyers for the company, and I said, you know, if these guys have an expertise in bedwetting, how can I have a company that's based on blockchain? Besides the fact that the company, that the, the bedwetting product supposedly had radioactive protons that were going to energize the product, and it was licensed from the University of California at Berkeley, and neither of those things turned out to be true. What's the connection between bedwetting and Bitcoin? And they said, well, no one has experience in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's the great thing about it. It's new to everybody. Right. So you can't be like, well, you know, there's a reason that people don't have blockchain or Bitcoin on their resume now. It's because it's so new. They haven't had time to add it. Although blockchain has been around for a while. So I might take a little bit of a, an argument with it at that point. It would seem to be like if you do have some experience, you would want to have that on your resume. Right. And it sounds like they weren't very easy to, to get in contact with when you were writing this story. And it was Bloomberg's Julie Verhage. Coming up, 2017, a bumpy 12 months for Uber. We'll take a look at challenges facing CEO Dara Khosr Shahi next year. This is Bloomberg. Big win, Matsuyoshi Sun of SoftBank of the Japanese conglomerate closes on a deal to buy a large stake in Uber. A person familiar with the deal tells us that the sale from investors implies a $48 billion valuation for Uber, way down from the $69 billion valuation it achieved not too long ago. Well, joining us now to discuss the news, Bloomberg's head of global technology coverage, Brad Stone, sitting right across from me in Bloomberg News. Uh, Gadfly columnist, Shira Ovide, join us as well. Shira, 
Uh, let me start with you. This deal uh, took quite a while for uh, these guys to put together, but it also really suggests that Uber is not what it used to be to the tunes of tens of billions of dollars. Yeah, I mean, I think it's no, you can't escape the fact that Uber is essentially less valuable than it was a couple of years ago when it was valued at $69 billion in a stock transaction. And now we're talking about a 30% haircut. Um, and yeah, you can make all kinds of excuses that this is a, a, a transaction not from the company itself, but from its existing shareholders. Uh, but obviously, it's been a bad year plus for Uber, and it's yeah. clear that that's hurt the valuation of the company. Uh, it's really sh uh, shocking when you look at it there in that great chart uh, by our, our producers here at the show. Um, Brad, uh, you know, this also took a while to do. Who were the sellers into this deal? Who, who decided, I, didn't, I liked it at $69 billion, but I don't like it at $49 billion. I'll take 48 Get me out. You, we don't know everyone who has sold, and this deal will probably take a couple of weeks to close, but you've got Benchmark, uh, an early investor, probably a seller, Menlo Ventures, another venture capital uh, firm. Uh, pro, you know, we don't know yet about Travis Kalanick, who still owns 10%, uh, Garrett Camp, the founder of Uber. Um, but I want to add one thing to what Shira said, yeah. right? This was a year of controversy, but it was also a year of very kind of ambiguous or even just negative economics for Uber. The company lost $4 billion in 2017, and, you know, there was a belief in the company for a long time that they could raise money and, and conquer and kill all the little guys, the regional players, and that just hasn't happened. Uber faces, you know, destructive competition in places like India and Singapore and Brazil. They've already done deals in Russia right. and China. The SoftBank deal can help kind of alleviate some of that competition because SoftBank has invested in all these other companies as well. Well, let's think of some of the things that Uber bailed on this year, right? They bailed on a Chinese investment, a very big Chinese investment. Uh, to, you know, and it seems like, to me, it seems like they got out of that deal pretty good. Uh, but they also bailed on their CEO and basically the entire executive suite, such as it was, bailed a lot of uh, ways that they run their business, allowing tipping uh, for customers. The, the, the seamlessness of the transaction, get in the car, get there, and get out, is gone. I would describe it as almost like it was a year where the manifest destiny of Uber to be a kind of monopoly in ride sharing around the world is gone. And that happened because of the controversy, but also happened because there were savvy investors out there like Masayoshi Sun and SoftBank that saw a tremendous opportunity here for the for these other players. And you know, part of it was Uber's controversy, but part of it was like saw, you know, capital flooding into the market and boosting propping up players like Ola and in India and Didi and China. So it's not winner take all anymore. Uber's not going to be the dominant player. Yeah. And I think that realization is part of what has led us here today to the fact that uh, on this investment uh, Uber's taking a valuation haircut. Shira, uh, you know me a long time, even longer than Brad Stone, and you know that I like my conspiracy theories. Let me posit one, that the last round of investors in Uber had a deal uh, uh, that they would not get diluted in the future, that any future valuation of the company would only be up. We certainly see that in a lot of venture deals. So that's why Matsuyoshi's son had to pay a billion dollars at a high valuation while almost simultaneously paying a lot less at a much lower valuation. It wouldn't trigger that reissuance of even more shares to the last round of investors. I, 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 like, your, I like your conspiracy theory. I have no idea if it's true. I like everyone who likes my conspiracy theory, so I like you too. I liked you before <laughs> that anyway. But, but it really is, it is striking here that, that uh, you know, as, as Brad put it, their manifest destiny is no longer so clear, and you can see it in the valuation. Yeah, and the thing that I wonder, right, is if Uber is no longer going to be this global winner take all, what is Uber? You know, what, how big can it eventually get, right? We already know, as Brad said, it's losing staggering sums of money. It's had to retreat from various businesses and parts of the world. And so if you invested in Uber a few years ago thinking that it's going to go into Russia and Indonesia and Africa and the restaurant delivery business and all these other places and just steamroll uh, every competitor, that no longer looks like a sure thing. And, and so w what is Uber worth if, it's, if it can't be successful everywhere in the world? Where it seems that the path to an IPO is wonderfully um, less obvious and more obvious at the exact same moment. The, 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 the time from now until IPO uh, is longer, and they have stated that they want to get to an IPO eventually. I'm not making that up. But also, it gets simpler because the varying shares uh, of stock, the, the fact that shareholders who don't have a lot of money at stake had more votes, some of the early investors, um, uh, uh, Shervin Pershavar among them, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the founder as well. 
Well, everything has been everything has been simplified in this deal with the governance reforms. You know, no extra voting power for the earliest shareholders. Um, you know, uh, SoftBank's taking board seats. Governance reforms. Um, this becomes a simpler company. Probably defactionalizes Uber a little bit. Benchmark. Defactionalize. Yeah, Brent, Benchmark, which wow. just sued. You know, sued uh, Travis. Like the old Yugoslavia. The Tito's yeah. out, and there's defactionalization. Yeah, so some of these lawsuits go away. Um, and yeah, and Dara said 2019 for an IPO. There's some of the uh, pressure for liquidity is taken off the table with this deal. So I think he's got room to operate now. All right, as I mentioned, 2017, a rocky year for Uber. Eric Newcomer Bloomberg looks at the company's past, present, and potential future problems. 2017, the year that Uber probably wants to forget. They blame everything oh, in my life on somebody email. else. Embattled CEO Travis Kalanick resigned. Dozens of executives left. Allegations surfaced of sexual harassment by employees that brought its company culture to light. But that wasn't all. Uber's top rival, Lyft, continued to eat away at market share, riding the coattails of the Delete Uber movement. And one of Uber's largest investors announced it's suing Uber over the alleged theft of trade secrets. To top it all off, to round out the year, Uber lost its London license, was ruled a transportation service rather than a digital one in the EU, and continues to face mounting legal battles from all over the globe. But Uber is trying to turn the corner, with new CEO Dara Khosrowshahi bringing in new legal heads and a COO as they try to right the ship. Khosrow Shahi's been on an apology tour the second half of 2017, meeting with angry regulators worldwide and bringing Uber's skeletons out of the closet, such as the massive hack of over 57 million accounts that have been covered up for more than a year. So how did Uber's business fare in 2017? Well, it grew. Gross bookings could reach 37 billion for the year. That's up from 20 billion in 2016. Still, the company lost a massive amount of money. The year's losses could reach over $4 billion. So what's on Kashra Shahi's to-do list in 2018? A new CFO, a new board chair, and new directors. And don't forget, cutting losses and reducing redundancies. But the legal matters loom largest. Uber and Alphabet face off in court in February over self-driving Waymo technology. And the U.S. Justice Department waits its turn, looking into five different cases over pricing, bribery, and trade secrets. But one thing's for sure, 2018 won't be the year Uber goes public. Instead, it will be the year it has to rebuild its reputation in the court of public opinion. Well, coming up, we're going to take a look at what's in store for Amazon in 2018. Discuss the role Alexa will play in the e-commerce giant's plans. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Indeed, check out Bloomberg Markets on the radio with Carol Masser and me. You can check out our Coast to Coast podcast on iTunes. And you can listen to Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com. And in the U.S. on Sirius XM Station 119, this is Bloomberg. Amazon could once again have been the biggest winner this holiday season. The tech titan sold, quote, tens of millions of Amazon and Alexa-enabled devices during the holidays, but they won't tell us exactly how many. But they did say the Echo Dot was the top-selling spot across all categories on the site. Amazon also said that 4 million people started Amazon Prime free trials or paid memberships in the one week over the holidays. And we discussed with the RBC Capital Markets Analyst Mark Mahaney. They said that their top two selling items, or one was an Echo and the other one was a Fire Stick. That was Alexa enabled. So there's a couple of wins here for the company. One, to get more of these devices out. But secondly, the, the tangential here is how many more uh, Alexa enabled devices there are. You can actually go on Amazon and search for Alexa enabled devices. Right. And you'll find your Sono speakers. You'll find your light bulbs. I mean, there's going to be an increasing number of things. So they get the ecosystem out there is a big win. They also put in a press release that they saw um, uh, millions of prime customers were using Alexa to order products on Amazon. So not only are they're selling you a device, but they're also selling you kind of a convenience. So it'll be easier to turn around in the kitchen and say, Alexa, order more coffee. Obviously, uh, apparently, uh, well, more yeah. Amazon customers are doing that. And I think that that's, I, I think that's, I think that's why they open up the platform. I mean, the Sonos yes. device, I got the app model of the Sonos device. It was like 450 bucks, so not, not for nothing. I hope she's not watching right now. But, but, uh, uh, but, but a really fantastic device, terrific sound, but it's not made by Amazon. Why would Amazon give that away? 
Well, you get the uh, Amazon ecosystem embedded in multiple devices, and Amazon just has more ways to offer you products and deliver products to you. I'm sorry, so you can order, you can interact with Amazon, not just when you're in here, in your desktop, with your phone, but maybe when you're driving, you can talk to your car and order from Alexa. I saw Garmin offering one of those things, an Alexa-enabled device for your car. So it's going to be a win. Right now, we think, and we're probably too conservative given the numbers they talked about in the press release this morning, right. we thought there were about 40 million Amazon and uh, Alexa Echo installed devices. That number's probably 50, could be even 60 million, and it's growing really? rapidly. There are a couple of other things, Corey, by the way, I thought were really interesting in the press release this morning. You already mentioned the other one, the number of Prime customers. We think there's 60 million in the U.S. They added four in just one week. You know, where there's subscriptions, or trials. Well, subscriptions. what's the conversion we'll rate there, do you think? So for someone that tries it, particularly on the holidays, it's probably lower than it is other times. Yeah, but you know, but give it 50%, something like that, it's probably higher. And then there was another one. Um, the number of units that they uh, delivered um, uh, expedited, either right. uh, Prime or same same day or next day doubled year over year. People talk about this price. And this on a revenue uh, run rate of about or revenue growth run rate of about 25. Yeah, yeah, but the point is there's there's more than just um, a price advantage and a selection advantage that Amazon has. Probably the biggest moat that they're building around the, the company is their ability to get you products faster than anybody else. It matters. It matters as, you, as you're going into uh, Christmas and you don't have those gifts ready to go. You can still order on the 23rd or the 24th, and then you recognize that, uh, that advantage, and you'll use that when you shop through, with Amazon throughout the year. That convenience advantage is really widening. That's the new moat at uh, Amazon. Our producer, Jackie Lopez, just bailing me out, showing us about 31 percent predicted growth on a year-over-year -year basis. <laughs> that, of course, includes a lot of very fast growth in Amazon Web Services. Um, but it, it's intriguing to me, too, that uh, the, all the different businesses we see these guys going into, do they all still go back looking at sort of B2C, selling stuff to people, selling physical goods to people that they might get into electronics, they might get into video, they might get into uh, whatever. Um, even even uh, uh, special uh, drugs, whatever, but really it's just about selling volume of goods to consumers. I think so. Uh, it's just building out the customer relationship, and one of the strongest relationships we as um, consumers have is with the people that you know we send, uh, give our money to, and you know, in, in response we get uh, right. in response to um, in order to get products. That's a very strong retail relationship. You can have a media relationship, but very few com very few companies have that tight of a media relationship. Maybe a Netflix, maybe a Google, and a Facebook. Book. I throw but Disney a, in there. But yes, but a I mean, re and Disney and multiple brands, right? But a retail relationship and Amazon now they're they're providing you goods and uh, some services, entertainment, um, and anything just uh, convenience. You can find products around the house. And yes, they're absolutely breaking into new categories. You know that expanding into groceries, the, si the single largest consumer product category. Right. They they're now the largest uh, vendor of apparel in this country. So there are there are still drug field opportunities for them. I think it's al almost inevitable that they go there. I think that's still three to five years out, but in inevitable. Um, I, I just wonder if they, they are really going to get brand. I think what's interesting about Alexis is that they're really getting brand a little bit, uh, which they've never really done. And Amazon seems to have a, a philosophical belief that people always migrate towards the cheapest thing. Brand is, is of course, the opposite of that. Uh, it creates the opportunity for Amazon private label, but also creates another revenue opportunity that's in nobody's numbers. So uh, Apple, the App Store, they take a 30% tax on all products right. uh, bought and sold on that uh, in the Apple Store. Google Home does the same thing. Right now, Amazon doesn't get any of that tax revenue, but you, you get 100 million, 200 million Alexa devices and Alexa-enabled devices out there, and all of a sudden, when that consumer says, I need more coffee, or I need diapers, or I need a car service, all of a sudden, you'll have providers that that could bid against each other for placement in those uh, voice search results. And then all of a sudden you could have app platform revenue. That could be a real big win. Those well, RBC Capitals, Mark Mahaney. That does it for this edition of Best of Bloomberg Technology. We're bringing you all the latest in technology throughout the week. Tune in every day, five o'clock in the east, two o'clock out west. And remember all episodes of Bloomberg Technology now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out as at technology, that's the handle weekdays. That's all for now, this is Bloomberg.